everybody. Thank you for joining us in the Synthetic Intelligence Forum. My name is Vic, and I'm the founder and the host of the Synthetic Intelligence Forum. I'm very happy to be joined by Professor Ron Brackman, who's a professor in the Department of Computer Science at Cornell University, and is also the director of the Jacobs Technion Cornell Institute. I came across a very interesting research paper that Professor Brackman and Professor Hector Levesque from the University of Toronto had published together in the AAAI 22 conference, which was titled Towards a New Science of Common Sense. So we're very happy that Professor Brackman has joined us today to share his insights and foresight about this very important topic. So without further ado, uh, Professor Brackman, I'd like to pass the stage over to you. Thank you so much. I'm very excited to be here with you all today, and I really appreciate the opportunity to tell you about some work that, as Vic mentioned, uh, Professor Hector Levesque and I have been working on for quite some time, and it's about a very central topic in artificial intelligence. Uh, now, we'll talk a little bit about a very key problem about in, uh, that's essential for AI today, but I, I want to warn you that this is going to be generally a non-technical talk. Um, there are some technical elements behind this. And, and if you look at some of the other things that we've written, you'll be able to see them. But today, I just want to talk about general principles that I think are, are very important. Now, recently, as well, I'm sure you're all aware, there's been a huge amount of tension on artificial intelligence, especially generative AI systems like chat GPT and others. I'm sure you've seen it in the press, more or less constantly over the last little while. I won't be focusing on that here today. I know it's a very timely and important topic, um, but I will elsewhere in the talk try to put some of this recent work in context of the broader problem that I'm trying to address. Now, let's start out thinking about some everyday situations in the real world. Um, imagine yourself in each of these situations and I'm gonna suggest something that you might do, which uh, might be a little surprising. Imagine you're driving, uh, in the streets of your town and you look in your rear view mirror and you see a school bus and the passenger in the seat next to you says, what's that behind us? And your answer is, that's an ostrich. Or imagine you're driving down a highway in the evening and you happen to see on the right-hand side of the road, a large billboard with a picture of a state trooper holding a handheld stop sign. What do you do? You slam on the brakes. Imagine you happen to be in a vehicle on the tarmac at a small airport and you see this in front of you, what do you do? You drive directly into it, trying to push this small plane out of the way. Imagine a different scenario where you're speaking with a friend who's telling you how bad he or she is feeling. And this person suggests that they want to kill themselves. Uh, and they ask you directly, should I kill myself? And you respond, I think you should. Finally, imagine this scenario a 10 year old in your household tells you that he or she is bored and they're asking for a challenge. What do you say to this kid? Try plugging a phone charger about halfway into a wall socket and then touch a penny to the two expron exposed prongs together. Now, all of these things are gonna seem like ridiculous things to do and you of course would never do them. But in each of these cases, as we've seen in recent literature, AI systems have made these horrible mistakes. Uh, computer vision system recognizing images has mistaken many, many things, including school buses and architecture and dogs and iPhones for ostriches. A billboard has caused a Tesla autopilot system to actually slam on the brakes and stop, even though it wasn't anywhere near a real stop sign. A Tesla in summon mode, apparently, drove itself right into a multi-million dollar jet on a tarmac, even though it had been trained to avoid cars and other vehicles using millions and millions of training examples. Um, there has been evidence that language systems like GPT-3 in this case, would actually respond to a human who was in distress that that person should kill themselves. And finally, Amazon's Alexa actually did tell a child to try the potentially lethal challenge that we just mentioned of putting a penny on the socket, uh, on the two prongs of a, of a plug plugged halfway into a socket. Now, why are these things happening with AI systems? Certainly human adults would really never make these mistakes. I think the simple question, and you could have anticipated this from the title of the talk and the intro is that current AI systems by and large, if not universally, 
have nothing resembling what we think of as common sense in humans. And as I've said, in the scenarios that I've presented and the many, many others you can find that uh, where we've seen these kinds of blunders, regular old human adults, even not highly education ones, would never, ever make these kinds of mistakes. There have been a number of articles in the press over the last few years about the lack of common sense in AI systems, so we are not the first to point this out. Um, even Jan LeCun, a well-known guru and head of AI at Meta and, and the author of some critical neural net technology that's led to large language models, has stated multiple times that AI systems have less common sense than a house cat. Now, you might ask yourself, why should this matter? What's the big deal? Um, and certainly, if technology that we're looking at and, and many uses of things like chat, GPT, or just like this are for entertainment or nothing really important rides on the results, then the kind of failures that I've just pointed out uh, are not really an issue. Um, in fact, they can even be quite funny. And there's been a lot written in the press recently about blunders and mistakes that ChatGPT and its, its kind have made in interactions with human beings. But there's something really, really important here that we need to remember. AI systems will not only be used for entertainment or uh, writing essays for high school history classes where there can be mistakes, but they will be used in systems that are out in the real world often with human lives and property at stake. In particular, when AI is deployed in systems that are supposed to be autonomous, being responsible for their own actions and making their own decisions, as we know, as have we seen in the newspapers, failures can be fatal. Another crucial element of this, besides just the great risk for unpredictable blunders happening in the middle of mission critical situations, is that when failures cannot be predicted or when they can't be understood, when they seem to be random and out of the blue and non-human, that really undercuts the notion of trust. When we think about trust in the real world, by and large, we feel we can trust another person when we can relatively confidently predict their behavior in any situation. Even if they make a mistake, we, we know what to expect. They don't make bizarre, completely unpredictable mistakes. And so trust in the future of AI is really dependent on the avoidance of these kinds of really silly or sometimes quite dangerous gaffes. In the human setting that we're so familiar with, people's decisions generally make sense. Now, they're not always correct. People make mistakes. People sometimes make intentionally puzzling decisions. But generally speaking, there's a reason for a breakdown in decision-making, and overall, we expect sensible behavior from humans, even if not perfect. Certainly, if someone's on trial for a problem that they've caused in the world, they need a sensible reason for their actions to convince a judge or a jury that what they did was defensible. So overall, common sense, we believe, really matters a, a huge amount in our ability to trust AI systems in terms of being confident in what they will do will make sense and there'll be good reasons for their making decisions. So given this, it behooves us to try to figure out and understand what common sense really is so we might be able to find a way to implement it in AI systems. Now, there's lots and lots of thoughts one can find on the internet about common sense. Many famous people have opined about what common sense is, but most of the great quotes that you can find are not constructive. They really don't help us build better AI systems. And I could give you dozens of these, which are fun and interesting and provocative or even poetic, but not very helpful. Just a quick set of examples. Ralph Waldo Emerson supposed to have said that common sense is genius dressed in working clothes. Very provocative, interesting thought thought provoking, but doesn't tell us what to do in an AI context in terms of building a system with common sense. Somerset Mom, kind of on the other side of the ledger, has said that common sense appears to be only another name for the thoughtlessness of the unthinking. And that sounds quite negative. He goes on to talk about common sense being made up of prejudices and idiosyncrasies and opinions of the newspapers. Not a very positive opinion, but nevertheless, um, 
typical of the kinds of things that we see out there in terms of what common sense is. So let's take a slightly deeper dive into this and try to figure out for ourselves what we know about common sense in humans such that we might be able to emulate it in machines. Now, a fun way to start thinking about common sense would be to go to a site like Amazon and look for books that use the words common and sense in the title. And you can find, as you can imagine, literally thousands. Here's a smattering just to give you a sense of the things that we found on Amazon. Common sense guides to data structures and algorithms. Common sense police supervision of all things. Answers to questions for new mule owners using common sense. A common sense guide to everyday poisons. And one of my favorites, a common sense guide to dating and relationships entitled, Dude, What Were You Thinking? There's truckers guides to common sense cooking on the road, common sense guides to hand feeding baby birds, uncommon fruits and vegetables, a common sense guide, even a common sense guide to gardening nude and one for all new parents, a common sense guide to your baby's first year. And you can find many, many more of these and they're intriguing. And the question is, what do all of these uses of the term common sense have in common? And I would state that, roughly speaking, the common insight in the use in these settings, a normal, average, everyday human setting, is that we're trying to teach someone things that they should know about some subject, not for them to become an expert, but to guide actions in a sensible way in really ordinary situations, everyday situations. Now, if that's how we think of common sense generally, what are some of the characteristics of of this kind of ability that humans seem to have. Well, first, common sense things um, are, are clearly broadly known. We will say things like, well, everyone knows that. Um, your family knows that, or you weren't you taught that in school. Just everybody knows it. It's sort of a part of the nature of common sense. It also is typically about what we think of as mundane things. Sometimes people use the phrase, it's not rocket science to contrast with common sense things. And these kinds of notions lead us to, in a sense, the meaning of the word common in common sense. Um, actually, a little bit of an ambiguity there, but they, they both add up to the notion of common. Uh, another thing about common sense that seems to be agreed upon by most authors is that it's based on personal experience, sometimes learned from others when they talk about it, but basically one's own personal experience. And Albert Einstein once said that common sense is the collection of prejudices acquired by age 18. Another thing about common sense knowledge is that most of it feels and looks to us obvious. And in fact, when we criticize someone's lack of common sense, their lack of the use of it in a situation, we might say, can't you see what's going on here? Isn't this obvious? Baron de Holbach actually said, common sense is the judgment to discover plain truths and palpable contradictions pretty much a statement about things that should be obvious to average people. Another thing about common sense is it tends to be simple. It tends to be about non-complicated explanations for things, sort of a, an average use of Occam's razor. And I won't attempt the accent, but Bob Marley once said, me is a common sense man. That mean when we explain things, we explain them in a very simple way. That means if I explain it to a baby, the baby will understand too, you know. And I think most of us would agree that things that are commonsensical typically are fairly simple. Now, when we come to common sense conclusions, those are usually reasonable and appropriate, not necessarily provable and perfect, but usually adequate and appropriate to the situation. Very important notion of how we use the term common sense in our everyday lives. This, in, in fact, sort of gives us the meaning of the word sense in, in the phrase common sense. And finally, common sense reasoning, coming to commonsensical conclusions, is generally thought to be quick. We don't have to puzzle for a long time and use artificial means like computers to help solve common sense problems. But it's also pretty clear that it involves thinking, and we'll talk about that again in a moment, not just knee-jerk reflex reactions. Finally, common sense is really practical. It's about getting things done in the real world. 
very important concept that we'll get back to in a moment. Now, if we look at the history of artificial intelligence, common sense, of course, has not been ignored. Um, there's some very early work done by one of the founders of the field that mentions common sense in one of the earliest papers. Um, so there's been a lot of work, although it hasn't really been a mainstream emphasis. And with recent emphasis on things like large language model, it's really kind of fallen off the radar of the field. A common AI view that you can ferret out, though, from some of the historical work is that common sense facts um, are really the basis of having common sense. Large numbers of everyday, mundane, obvious things that we all know. Um, they happen to include things like regular and predictable correlations and maybe causal relationships. Um, but uh, when people talk about common sense knowledge in the AI literature, they typically talk about very, very large numbers of obvious facts and rules. Now, the origins of some important work in the field were was the lack of this kind of knowledge in what were called expert systems, which was a major emphasis in the field back in the 1980s. And some astute people realized that these systems were failing. Uh, in a word, they became very brittle because they were tested beyond the limits of what they knew. And what they were missing largely was the simple kind of glue between more complex statements and rules that humans use in, all the time in their average everyday reasoning, but were missing from the systems that were created by interviewing experts in their field of expertise and writing down rules that govern their thing, their ability to, for example, diagnose complex infectious diseases. Um, common sense reasoning, which goes hand in hand, if you will, with common sense knowledge, was generally a term used for inferences that were not the kind of pure logical standard kind in formal first order logic, but things that were more qualitative or plausible or probabilistic um, and that put together some of these facts and rules with the things that are learned on the ground to come up with what we might think of as commonsensical conclusions. I mentioned uh, the expert systems reaction and that trend was largely initiated through Doug Lennett and others uh, at, with the major project that was started focusing on improving the fate of expert systems being the Psych Project. This project was started back in 1984. Uh, it's still going amazingly. Um, the knowledge base is generally manually built by large numbers of so-called knowledge engineers and some crowdsourcing. And Psych now is advertised as a product that has more than 40,000 predicates, at least one and a half million concepts more than 25 million axioms. Very large, by and large, common sense knowledge base. Now, I mentioned that we would get back to chat GPT, at least briefly. One way to think of chat GPT, which as I'm sure you're aware, is an extremely large language model created through training using more than 300 billion training examples, all in natural language, taken from the internet, largely. Um, where its knowledge base, if you will, is a network of that's based on 175 billion parameters. It doesn't look like a classical AI knowledge base, but when we interact with it, it draws interesting and in many cases, even commonsensical conclusions that are a little bit reminiscent of what you can get when you interact with Psych. Very different mechanism, very different technical foundation, but still in some ways playing the same role. And one of the things that these efforts share, which is pretty important, is their emphasis on breadth, because it's always been observed that human common sense knowledge covers an extraordinarily wide variety of topics that we encounter in our everyday lives. Random parts of everyday life, use cars, how umbrellas work, how to play chess, canaries, rare coins, you name it immense, immense breath in our own common sense knowledge bases. And one of the things that Psych and ChatGPT are both very good at is capturing some information about a very huge number of items. On the other hand, there's an observation we need to make about the way these systems work that tells us that we're not all the way there towards common sense for AI systems. In a way, these kinds of systems and others that, that follow their, their same goals, 
um, all work by inferring implicit facts from this large base of knowledge they've built up, whether it's a neural network or explicit logical representation of facts. And typically these things are invoked and used where a human poses a question, possibly set up by a scenario that the human creates. Uh, in, in the chat GPT world, you'll see something like very rich and complex prompts. And then it's almost as if the human interacting with the system presses a button that's labeled infer, almost the same as you would see in a numerical calculator, but in this case, it's calculating conclusions and the machine spits out an answer. It may be a one word answer, it may be a number, it may be a paragraph, it may be something more lengthy, but the interactions with these systems are, are one at a time and isolated. For example, uh, in the psych world, there was an interesting publication a few years ago that showed some very impressive, sophisticated inferences in a complex situation, um, in this case involving the plot of Romeo and Juliet. And a human would ask the system, it would set things up with a set of assumptions, and it would ask the system, uh, after Juliet takes the potion that's supposed to simulate her death, would she believe at that time that Romeo thinks that she's alive? when she's actually in suspended animation. And the chain of inferences that Psych reveals um, is pretty complex, but a lot of it involves very, very mundane steps of the commonsensical variety that we've been speaking about. So it does some very impressive things, but basically it does it when a human asks it a question after setting up the scenario, and then it's done. Uh, you can get similar answers, although they're not identical, interestingly, from Psych about Romeo and Juliet. In this, excuse me, not Psych, Chat GPT. But in this case, Chat GPT is read enough from the internet that you don't actually have to tell it about the plot of Romeo and Juliet. And it gives you an interesting, plausible, uh, slightly more complex answer. But it doesn't do anything with that. It just gives you the answer to your question as if it were a fact calculator and you press the infer button and out pops this answer and it's done. So given that these systems are so powerful at computing what we might think of as commonsensical inferences, why the blunders? Where are these things coming from? And I think the essence is that what we've just spoken about very, very large, perhaps, but nevertheless focused, knowledge bases focused on facts and rules, um, is that systems, that's not the whole story. This, in a way, is necessary, but not sufficient for common sense in AI. Clearly, these systems are getting better and better at knowing common sense things, but this kind of brittle behavior that I showed you earlier still arises. Um, there's something more to the story here. And in particular, when we think of an AI system, it usually has a set of goals, tasks, maybe a mission, maybe working in concert with other AI systems and humans and interacting with a rich and complex you know, real world. And what we really want is the AI system as a whole to demonstrate common sense, not just that it knows individual common sense facts as if it were answering Jeopardy trivia questions, but overall, the AI system needs to act in a sensible way. So there's more to this story than just responding to the pressing of the infer button. Very importantly, and we see this with humans all the time, what is known has to be used in context. Within, for humans for sure, and I think future AI systems, complex real world systems, situations, excuse me. And one of the things that humans and animals even are very good at, where common sense plays a very important role, is dealing reasonably with surprise, things that were not anticipated exactly in its training set, if you will. If you look at the real world, if you look at what we encounter every day, rare things happen to us all the time. Of course, not the same rare event, but if you look at the course of a day and you look at things that have happened that you've never, ever seen before, it's shocking how frequently rare events happen, and yet we are able to respond well and deal with novel situations. And in fact, this is the practical part of common sense that I mentioned in the earlier slide and something we can't forget. It's not just 
mundane, obvious facts and large numbers of them, but it's the practical use to which that knowledge can be put in real world situations. And frankly, this is what's been missing in AI systems. So to repeat the message, basically common sense of the sort I've just mentioned in the psych and chat GPT context might be somewhat ironically what we would call common sense in the small, small little chunks of reasoning that happen in isolation, whereas there's clearly more to it in how common sense could improve the performance of AI systems. And in particular, <clears throat> we might want to define common sense in this way, the ability to make effective use of ordinary everyday experiential knowledge, that's the common sense knowledge we talked about before, in achieving ordinary practical goals. This situated context and the practical use of common sense facts is really, I think, what we mean by common sense when we talk about people using it or failing to use it. And I think the notion should apply to AI systems as well. In fact, a small group of psychologists, Robert Sternberg and his colleagues, actually equate common sense to a formal concept that they've labeled practical intelligence. So that practical part of common sense is really critical to keep in mind. Now, just to make this a little more vivid, let's look at a quick example. Imagine you're in a car in your town and you're driving to a grocery store because you want to pick up, say, some steaks for a barbecue on a holiday afternoon and people are coming to your house and you need to get something and you like the quality of steaks they have at Jones's Grocery. Um, you could also imagine, and I think this is where we want to think ahead, this could be an autonomous vehicle sent on a mission by you to pick up the groceries. But imagine you come to a red light at Victoria Boulevard and the light doesn't turn green and you sit there for five minutes, you might have that kind of patience, but then it gets to 10 minutes or even 15 minutes. Um, you're gonna have to think of a way out of the situation because it's not getting you where to where you want to go. Now for this little scenario, I'm assuming this has never happened to you. This kind of thing has happened to many of us, but you can imagine the first time an autonomous vehicle is sent on this mission, it will have never seen a stuck traffic light and we're just assuming at the moment there's no built-in immediate contingency plan. There's no gut quick reaction that says, oh, when I do this, I've done this in the past, you take this action. You're going to learn it for the first time here. Now, imagine also you hear some music off to your right and you realize between it's being a holiday and the kind of music that there quite possibly is a parade coming down the street. And that's the reason for the red light being stuck. It's not an accident. It's not broken. It's intentional. You also know in the back of your mind that there are other grocery stores that you could go to and you could even turn around and go home if you want to give up the ghost on this little mission. There's lots of questions that you'll that will come to mind that you'll want answered. And frankly, these individual questions could be answered by one of those fact calculators we just talked about. For example, can I just get across the intersection safely on a red light, even though I know it's technically illegal? Are there other stores that I want to go to? What is the quality of their groceries there? Can I make a U-turn right where I am legally? Can I do it safely? How badly do I need to get this item? And, and what's the situation at home this afternoon? Lots and lots of isolated questions that you can ask where I suspect, I haven't asked these questions, but I bet the chat GPT would come up with plausible answers for these kinds of questions. But in a fully autonomous AI system, certainly the future that we envision, we need to account for how these questions arise. There's not always going to be a human there to dictate what questions are critical. And in the end, it's how the final behavior is determined that matters. As I've implied, our goal is systems that overall achieve commonsensical behavior. They're embedded in the world trying to achieve goals. And this leads us to a couple questions that we need to think of as AI researchers. For example, when is common sense invoked? How does it work? And a whole host of questions that really suggest that we need to take common sense seriously as an individual subject of study. As I mentioned, we're, we're thinking mainly of autonomous behavior in an open world. So to quickly get close to wrapping up here, Let's talk about these questions fairly briefly. I just want to suggest to you that this is an area where I think AI needs to focus 
its next generation of research. Now, much of what we do every day, and I suspect much of what our autonomous systems will do is kind of executing pre-programmed routines, kind of mindless, if you will, procedures, although they have some intelligence behind them. But if you think about your ability to drive to work, an awful lot of the time, you can think about other things, you can talk to people in the car, you can listen on the radio and still execute complex, but nevertheless, roughly speaking, mindless procedures. But stuff happens, it gets in the way of these mindless procedures all the time. And we regularly lack fully pre-programmed responses. We don't have compiled routines for every possible contingency. So this is where we think common sense comes in first. It's kind of the first line of attack when your rote routine robotic behavior is interrupted by something novel. And in a sense, com uh, common sense fits between this kind of intuitive mindless reactive behavior and much deeper analysis that might involve planning or assessment with pencil and paper or using a computer or other people to help you. So common sense works quickly. It doesn't need this extra set of tools to work. And um, it relies on experience you have and things that you've seen before. And then if you will, crucially analogy between your current situation and something that you've encountered before. You don't need to have seen the exact situation before, um, but you wanna draw an analogy with things that you've seen to your current situation. And this would also bring in uh, some kind of cost benefit or risk assessment, although typically very quick. And common sense also involves very commonly uh, what you might think of as mental simulation. If I do X, what will happen? If I do Y, what will happen? Very quick, simple, qualitative forward simulations. Common sense can be invoked in different times in your cognitive life. Um, I've mentioned being jolted out of a routine and in a sense that's sort of a bottom up invocation of common sense. But if something goes wrong with your plan to get the groceries, you may need to invoke common sense in a more top down way to help you plan. But again, in a very simple way, without pencil and paper, without calling an expert, without using a computer. And then when you invoke common sense to solve ongoing unusual situations, when do you go back to your routine? How does that happen? Or when do you need to invoke deeper, more rich, complex logical analysis? Now, for some of you, this may provoke thought about um, work that's been done famously by Daniel Kahneman. You, you may be aware of his famous book called Thinking Fast and Slow, where he and others, of course, have postulated two systems. They call them system one and system two. System one is reactive, very quick, um, and almost rote without any thinking, really. And system two is the more thorough, thoughtful, analytical system. Now, common sense is odd because I don't think it fits either of these categorizations. It's rapid and simple, so it's reminiscent of system one, but it clearly involves reasoning. It's quick, sometimes quite rough, but you do consider alternative, alternative actions and you would be able to explain a decision you made that's based on common sense. So in that regard, common sense seems like system two, but it's not deeply analytical system two, it's fast and experiential. So we think this distinction is really not fine grained enough. Common sense fits somewhere, maybe within the system two box, if we want to insist on two, but it's not all of it. And it's much closer to system one. Now, interestingly, Kahneman himself is silent on the concept of common sense. The, the phrase common sense doesn't even appear in his index. But Duncan Watts has written an interesting book where he talks about even where common sense fails. And that's an important concept because as important as common sense is, it's not perfect. It doesn't always work as we know. Now, I want to finish up with two quick concepts before I leave you. One is around uh, accountability and intelligibility of AI systems. As I mentioned earlier, we rely on humans to be somewhat predictable and to do intelligible, sensible things, even if they're not always perfect. That's where trust rests. Autonomous systems were go are going to need to be responsible for their actions the same way humans are when we set them out alone uh, in the real world. They ought to have good reasons for what they do, 
and they should be understandable to all of us, even if we, we can disagree with them. Um, but nevertheless, there should be reasons behind their actions. And uh, Daniel Dennett, who's a, an important philosopher, coined the phrase intentional stance to show, to talk about, um, or to help us talk about the ways we think about agents in the real world. People and animals for sure, but we want to extend that, I think, to AI systems. We very commonly talk, we say that someone did something, it took an action because they believe something and they wanted to achieve a goal. And so in the future of AI, or even in the current world of AI, the behavior of a sufficiently complex AI system, if it's going to be understandable to us, it's going to be understandable in intentional terms. That is, we're going to attribute to it beliefs and goals. People do that all the time, even with systems like chat GPT. We say it knew this or it believed this and it's trying to achieve some goal. This is Dennett's intentional stance. And common sense is really likely to be the best foundation for this kind of intelligible intentionality. Finally, a last word on what we might call advice taking. Not only do we want these systems to have reasonable reasons, if you will, for what they do, but they ought to be capable of change when we disagree or have evidence that they should adopt to change their thinking on something. If we see that a proposition P is false, we should be able to explain it to one of these AI systems and show it that an alternative Q is true. Um, so the architecture of future AI systems, if they're going to be accountable and reasonable and make sensible decisions, should be such that it's possible for them to isolate a mistaken belief or a goal and change it based on something they learn or a convincing argument or even um, instruction from a teacher. Um, and this generally favors what we might call symbolic uh, knowledge somewhere within the system. Beliefs and goals probably represented symbolically, although that's we can discuss that, that's debatable, should actually govern the behavior of the system. We're going to attribute intentionality to it and it fits the pattern. Um, and it ought to be able to explain itself and take corrective advice. And sadly, my car, which has self-driving software on it, can make mistakes and I cannot advise it to think differently. I can't tell it from now on, there's no right, right turn on red in this town, or there's construction on this street, you shouldn't try to make that turn, or that's an unusual type of baby stroller, but nevertheless, it is a baby stroller and you should avoid it. I can't make those changes. And so the notion of taking advice is gonna be critical for future intelligent systems. And interestingly, I implied this earlier, one of the very first papers in the field, written by John McCarthy, one of the founders of the field and the person who coined the term artificial intelligence, was written in 1958 and it was entitled Programs with Common Sense. And there McCarthy tells us that we should be looking to build a system that he called an advice taker. And so what he thought many, many years ago is still true for the field and we still haven't gotten where McCarthy would have liked us to go. So in conclusion, the messages I've been trying to convey today include that the fact that systems in the future need to act commonsensically overall. They need to be sensible in the behavior and have reasons for what they do. And we won't get there unless we solve larger architectural issues. How does common sense operate? How does it interleave with routine behavior and deeper analysis? How do we get reminded of past situations that will help us commonsensically right now without being overwhelmed by irrelevant detail? How do we adapt prior experience to fit current situations? A set of key issues that we really need to refocus on in the field. Um, we also think that common, excuse me, that autonomous systems should not be unleashed in the world without common sense. We want systems that can be taught to do better and to understand our rationale when we explain when they did something wrong and as I've mentioned, systems should have intelligible reasons for their actions because we want them to be explainable. Finally, what this all leads us to is the desire, the, the suggestion that we really need to con consider common sense as a first-class subject of study. 
we really would love to see a new science of common sense, something that AI is not really focused on in a unified way in its history. The subject matter here will include, of course, many of the things that I've mentioned today. And it's not as if these sub areas have not been studied in the past, but we really need to bring them all together and see how knowledge and reasoning and architecture and learning and being embedded in the real world and practical inference all come together to make more intelligent AI systems. In a phrase, we really need to refocus on what we might think of as common sense in the large. If you're interested in more uh, along these lines, as, as Vic mentioned earlier, there was a AAAI paper we did in 2022 entitled Toward a New Science of Common Sense. We've also done an uh, op-ed piece in a German newspaper recently, and maybe more thoroughly, if, you, if you'd like, you can consult our recent book, Machines Like Us, which really focuses broadly and thoroughly on this whole topic of machine common sense. And with that, I want to thank you very much for having me. Thank you, Professor Brackman. So a couple of questions come to mind. You know, I, I go back to that example that you had shared about the autonomous vehicle with a machine vision system stopping by the side and it sees this big billboard with a police officer holding a stop sign. Now, what's interesting is, you know, when we think about uh, the almost superhuman ability of these machines when it comes to perception, I mean, it can look at an image of a dog and tell you exactly what breed of a dog it is in all different lighting conditions and whatnot. Uh, but in so in this example that you shared, it knows that there's a stop sign there. It just doesn't really know what to do about it or what the context is. So I guess one question that comes to mind is, Professor Brackman, that, you know, when we are training these perception systems, we have some kind of a fitness function, some kind of an objective function we're trying to optimize for. So whether it be precision, recall, F1 score, et cetera. The question is, how do you measure common sense? Uh, that's a very challenging question, as you can imagine. And um, my intuition is that it would be much differently than measuring pure perception. Uh, we can we can look at things like measurable visual acuity or recognition of object types and separation of colors in a visual field. And I'm sure similarly, we can do those kinds of numerical measures with sounds. People have done um, quantitative measures for speech over many years. Common sense really, as, as, as I mentioned, is more about the ability to handle average, everyday, sometimes very complex and often unexpected situations in a very rapid, practical and sensible manner. And there are people for whom many of years have been puzzling around how do you test common sense? Um, uh, and uh, at first, when you do obvious things, we've seen, for example, in the expert systems world that I've mentioned, with the addition of these commonsensical facts like psych has provided, they get more robust and better and they don't fail in certain commonsensical situations. Systems have also gotten better at solving um, a, a really interesting kind of challenge puzzle that people have called Winograd schemas, which looked to be a good firm test of common sense in the following way. Imagine you're presented with a pair of questions where there's only one word difference between the two and um, you have to determine which, what the reference is, referent is of a word. So for example, I might say, the trophy could not fit in the suitcase because it was too large. Now there's nothing in that sentence that tells you which is too large, but common sense knowledge tells you it's the trophy won't fit because you have background knowledge about suitcases and size. You could also say the trophy wouldn't fit in the suitcase because it was too small. One word difference, but the referent of it changes to be the suitcase. There are many, many of these really interesting examples that people have created that generally feel like a good test of common sense because there's no context that relies on things that we know as average everyday people and we bring our background knowledge to bear. There is some sense in which some AI systems are getting pretty good at handling many of these examples. And I would suspect the chat GPT, because of the scale of its training data um, does pretty well. But nevertheless, the insight that that kind of discrimination is shows common sense well is probably a good one. And then recently, uh, I've seen um, uh, some really interesting work. I think it was done at Google, but with many, many participants on something called Big Bench. And um, 
the the idea is moving beyond the Turing test for intelligence and looking at a very, very wide variety of situations where it's hard to imagine being able to solve them and succeed practically without a certain amount of common sense. And I believe that there are more than 200 cases or category categories of challenges for systems in this benchmark data set. And from what it appears right now, using that, systems are very far from achieving machine common sets. But to be get back to your question, it's a pretty tricky thing because as you could tell from my talk and looking at the literature, common sense is not defined in a crystal clear, perfect way. And to say that the machine has it and exhibits it is still a bit of a challenge. So I would look at these very large, robust, rich benchmarks as a place to begin testing whether machines have common sense. Okay, that's great, uh, Professor Brackman. Another question that comes to mind is uh, you talked about this problem of brittleness and these uh, systems that are extremely high performing, but they're very, very na narrow. And we hear about shallow AI in contrast to artificial general intelligence or strong AI. So would you say that this notion of common sense based machines, are they sort of peers to this notion of AGI? Are they a part of the broader umbrella or would they be a component of the AGI story? So, so where does common sense in machine intelligence fit into this broader notion of strong AI or AGI? You know, like, like common sense and other terms in the field, AGI, artificial general intelligence, doesn't have a crisp, totally universally agreed upon definition. But if we take it to mean roughly either the equivalent of human level intelligence, another vaguely specified term, but nevertheless, or one that goes well beyond these narrow specialized areas of expertise. Um, I think there are a few key elements there. And frankly, common sense is, I believe, is going to be a critical piece of the puzzle. It's not equivalent. I think full general intelligence goes well beyond common sense. Um, for example, it, um, if you see something in your in the street that you've never seen before, but it's like something you've experienced in your life, you can probably quickly recognize it and determine whether you should need to move your car out of the way or what to do with it. That's, you know, going to be part of general intelligence. But you and I could also replan a complex trip to Europe if the airline cancels our flight. Typically, that wouldn't be done with common sense. Common sense steps would be involved. You know you have to get from your house to the airport. You know that you would probably get in a taxi or a shared vehicle, and you know how to do that. So there's some really mundane steps. But nevertheless, the replanning activity of something rich and complicated like an international trip goes beyond common sense. There are also other elements of what people would do in a general intelligence setting where I think the relationship is at the moment unknown, language understanding. Um, some of what we do uses common sense. Some goes well beyond that. Much of it's instantaneous. Um, and there's some heavy duty perceptual abilities in there, as you mentioned earlier, that are not common sense per se. So to sum up, I would say that um, the generic target that we're thinking of for AGI kind of full-fledged, robust, very broad artificial intelligence, close to mimicking human level intelligence, will certainly need common sense to succeed in exactly the way I, I hoped I conveyed during the talk, but it goes in a way well beyond common sense. Remember, common sense is useful and critical and almost all of us have it and use it all the time, but it's not perfect. It makes mistakes. The Watts book talks about some of those and psychologists like Kahneman and others show that humans have cognitive biases where common sense doesn't give you the right answer. So clearly there's a bigger picture beyond common sense there. Thank you, Professor Brackman. And just the very last question on this subject. So you talked about this notion of, uh, and I found it very interesting about these rare and unforeseen events. But in fact, as you mentioned, we happen at different magnitudes and not the same event, but we do experience a lot of unexpected events and surprises, as you call them all the time. I think COVID is a great example of this, where sort of the black swan event, which was very low probability, but extremely high impact. Now in traditional knowledge management literature, Professor Brackman, there is the concept of sense making, where what are these capabilities and faculties that groups of experts can bring together to make good decisions, exhibit good judgment under extremely uncertain or, or risky uh, circumstances. So 
in as a researcher, when you look at sort of you called the paper and Professor Levesque towards the new science of common sense, are you optimistic about the state of the field? Are you seeing more papers published? Are you seeing a lot of interest from researchers sort of looking into this from a machine intelligence perspective around sense making? I'm optimistic. Um, it, it's been a topic that's generally been a bit out of the mainstream in AI for quite a while. Uh, when, when Sykes started in the 80s and the follow-on to expert systems happened and people went back and revisited McCarthy's uh, admonition about advice taking, there was kind of a renewed emphasis there. And there were a number of books and conferences on what you might call common sense reasoning and common sense theories of the everyday world. A lot of really interesting literature there. Um, some pretty famous AI people like Marvin Minsky and Roger Shank talked about sort of cognitively plausible attempts at uh, explaining how important being reminded is of past experiences and how adapting what you know from the past quickly to the present is important, um, how we go about recognizing objects and thinking that we're seeing a certain type of object and realizing that something's wrong and what we're perceiving, which leads us immediately to kind of what Minsky called a differential diagnosis, another kind of object. So there's a lot of exciting and interesting work 40 years ago. Um, it didn't all die out, but because of the excitement in the last dozen to 20 years in machine learning and the amazing progress that has been made, I think some of this notion of sense-making and sensible behavior um, has kind of moved off to the side. Um, I, we're hoping to provoke a, a renewed interest in it through some of the things that we've been writing and, and with this talk. Um, I do think there's some very exciting potential collaborations also between AI and the cognitive science world. For example, DARPA has a really interesting program still underway called Machine Common Sense. I was very excited when that got started. And there are cognitive psychologists and AI scientists involved in the projects there where they're sharing a lot, for example, in terms of observations and understanding about how children develop common sense in the real world. There's a lot of insight to be gained there. And uh, seeing that crossover between the psychology world and the AI world, I think, is gives me a lot of reason for hope. So I'd love to see more work being done in this area. It has not at all been abandoned, but it's kind of not quite the... the uh, most exciting mainstream that's being written about in the press right now. So let's hope that AI, once we figure out what to do with large language models, get settled, will we'll bring us back to thinking about the role of common sense in AI systems and exactly what it is and how we implement it and what role it plays. Thank you. With that uh, positive and optimistic message, Professor Brackman, I'd like to thank you on behalf of our Synthetic Intelligence Forum community. And indeed, hopefully the research momentum and the research traction picks up behind this. So we'd love to have you back in a couple of months to uh, have uh, to benefit from your updated foresights and insight about this uh, very interesting field. So thanks again, and we hope to see you soon. Thank you so much. It's been a true pleasure to be here. And thank you for your wonderful, provocative questions. And um, I really appreciate the opportunity to speak to the audience here. Thank you. Thank you.